so let's look at the work of flexion as it relates to range of motion or how far you flex. If you pull on a tendon in a straight line, there is only one direction of force and that is a linear or straight force that's being applied through the tendon. It's like pulling on a rope at one end and pulling straight to the other end. But if the tendon goes around a pulley, there's now a curved direction to the tendon and there's now the continuing linear force but there's also this bending force. This force where the tendon wants to go in another direction because of the curve around which it must traverse. So the more we flex the joint, the greater this force that wants to pull the tendon away from the joint. Do you remember we said that the more you flex the finger, the greater the friction? Well, this is in large part why, because the tendon is wanting to move away from the joint and not stay parallel to the joint. The angular maximum of the PIP and DIP joints is greater than the angular maximum of the metacarpal phalangeal joint. What this means is that the work of flexion at end range at the PIP and DIP joints is greater than the work of flexion at the metacarpal phalangeal joint. And if there's bowstringing, those are greatly increased. The work of flexion, the power required, the excursion required is greater. So I would rephrase this by saying the greater the joint range of flexion, the greater the work of flexion. It's harder to flex at end range and that is especially true considering the external factors as well as the internal factors that increase resistance. The core take-home message then is end range of finger flexion increases the force required to flex the finger. For that reason we're going to discuss waiting to work on end range flexion and not having that as part of your initial post-operative goal. Here, redrawn from Wu and Tang in 2013, is a graph without numbers, but it shows you the relative resistance to tendon gliding during slight flexion, what I would call mid or moderate flexion, and the end range of flexion. And you can see that the slight to moderate rises only very slightly, but there is a very steep rise at the end range of finger flexion. What's the clinical application of this information? If your patient has had a flexor tendon injury in the distal zones, zone 1 and 2, this information would suggest that we should have the patient do limited active flexion postoperatively. Here with a video courtesy of Dr. Lalonde, shows a patient actively flexing through limited range, asking him not to even try to go any further and then extending actively. Now we're talking here about only active motion in terms of work of flexion and range. This does not apply to passive flexion of the digit, only active. Von Strein and Pettengill in their chapter in Tang suggest that at one week you touch the index finger and at week two the patient touches the long finger which can also be called the middle finger and then in week three or four if everything is doing well that they proceed to touch the ring and little finger. This gives the patient a specific goal and a specific range that they can identify and repeat relatively accurately. So when we're 
Thinking about work of flexion and range of motion, our conclusions are that the greater the joint flexion, the greater the work of flexion. So in the distal flexor zones, it would be appropriate to increase range of active flexion slowly over the recuperation period rather than work for end range immediately. Remember, this is active flexion we're talking about now, and passive range of motion would be continued without these considerations. Now let's look at work of flexion from the point of view of friction and see how that influences the energy it takes to flex the finger. We know that the rope on the lift going around the corner of the rock would allow significant friction to be created when the rope is pulled one direction or the other. But if we place a pulley uh, at the edge of the rock, the rotation of the pulley will allow the rope to traverse with minimal friction. The same is true in the finger. So what increases tendon friction? Gapping of the tendon. The actual location of the tendon determines how much friction there is and will explain. The size of the tendon or the suture tendon within the pulley determines friction. Moving across the edge of a pulley also determines friction, as does an increased load or pull on the tendon. Let's look at these in a bit more detail. Tendon gapping. In this schematic drawing, the white represents a tendon. Here is the suture, which has allowed the tendon ends to pull apart and here is the drawing of the pulley. So as the tendon is pulled proximally and this gap moves toward the pulley, the gap actually allows the pulley to catch the edge of the proximal tendon, creating significant friction and resistance to flexion. This can be enough that it can actually rupture the tendon repair but at the very minimal it will create increased resistance. The actual location of the tendon can also determine the amount of friction experienced by moving the tendon. Intrasynovial tendons which are bathed in the synovial fluid which is a lubricant are as you would expect less likely to increase friction with motion than extrasynovial tendons. Here we see a dramatic difference between the green line on the bottom which represents the flexor digitorum profundus. We see that it stays relatively level as the number of cycles of movement are increased. But the purple line which represents the palmaris longus tendon which is extrasynovial shows a dramatic rise in the amount of friction generated as the number of cycles of motion increase, demonstrating that there is a significant difference as the cycles increase between the amount of friction experienced in an intrasynovial versus an extrasynovial tendon. This illustration is redrawn from a chapter in the Tang book. I would urge you to consult the original image on page 28 for which I was unable to obtain permission. But even in this uh, schematic representation, the point is that the flexor digitorum profundus tendon, illustrated here on the top, before testing is very smooth, after one thousand cycles in a zoomed image, even though it is different from the original image, it is consistent and therefore relatively smooth, particularly as compared to the palmaris longus, seen here also as smooth, but in a zoomed image after a thousand cycles is much rougher and more resistant to motion.
Now the synovial areas of the hand are somewhat different. If the tendon is located in zone 1 or 2, the synovium bays the epitenon with a thin visceral membrane which lubricates it. This, even though it is the most constricted area, it is the best lubricated. So from a lubrication point of view, this is the area of the least friction. As you look at the extrasynovial areas where the tendon is not lubricated with synovium, we see that the peritenon has a loose connective tissue which provides the protection as well as the blood supply. But these areas with cyclical motion create the most friction. But the carpal tunnel can be considered to be a somewhat hybrid location or if you will a combination of both zone characteristics that we previously discussed. There is a subsynovial connective tissue that is around each tendon even though it is within a synovial bursa. Movement within this zone would give you less friction than the extrasynovial areas but more friction than the intrasynovial areas of zone 1 and 2. Now the size of the tendon which is represented here in a schematic drawing within the pulley clearly would make a difference in the amount of friction. If the tendon is relatively small in relationship to the pulley, there's room to move. But if the tendon or the tendon sutures particularly is really tight within the pulley, then any cyclical motion obviously will increase the friction created by that tight fit. A normal tendon moving through a pulley area normally would increase the friction by only 10 percent. But if the perfect suture is placed in the tendon and it moves relatively freely under the pulley and we could call it a low friction repair, that still increases the internal resistance by almost 300 percent. And that is more than doubled if there's a high friction repair, a repair that's excessively bulky or that's gapping or that has difficulty fitting underneath the pulley. We previously discussed the problem created at the edge of the pulley if the tendon is gapping and is caught on the pulley. But even if the tendon is not gapping, where the tendon begins to heal or where it's sutured together is usually bulbous and larger than the surrounding tendon. So as this tendon moves proximally and moves into the pulley, that increased bulk has difficulty going into the pulley and there's significant resistance and friction created at this edge where the bulk is attempting to go through a more restricted space. Especially if the patient is moving excessively into flexion, this repeated friction will increase inflammation and therefore increase the resistance even more. Here we see a graph that shows us that as the load increases, so does the friction. As the grams of load have increased, so has the friction. Therefore, it is correct to say that the amount of friction created is proportional to the load applied. This tells us that there's little value in having a patient squeeze anything in the early stages of tendon rehabilitation because the increased friction is detr detrimental. We can also learn from this graph that looks at friction versus velocity that velocity or speed has nothing to do with creating friction. 
If we think back to the rope around the rock, we can appreciate that the speed with which we pull it is not going to alter the friction as much as how hard we pull it against resistance. Many surgeons are working to develop new approaches to flexor tendon repair that will reduce the friction even more. Some are looking at sutures that are both high strength as well as low friction. Some surgeons resect the flexor digitorum superficialis as a way of creating more room for the movement of the flexor digitorum profundus and thereby reducing friction. Tangsworth on incising pulleys has also led to our ability to reduce friction. And last but not least are some techniques that have recently been developed which will assure the prevention of gapping, thereby also significantly reducing friction. So what are our conclusions about the work of flexion that is increased as we increase friction. Friction is created by tendon gapping, by the location of the tendon, with the least friction being in zone 1 and 2, the most in zone 3 and 5, and zone 4 having a mid-level of friction as compared to the other two. Friction is also altered by the size of the pair within the pulley, moving across a pulley edge, and an increased load or pull on the tendon. Mm -hmm.